So I'm going to tell you the story of the southern sea otter, and um, because it was a remnant population, the story is perhaps a little longer than some of the other stories. I'm going to try to keep, keep it going quickly so I can make my time. So any story of modern sea otters begins with the fur trade. You already heard something about that, the fur trade of the 1700s and 1800s. It came to California last, um, progressed along the North Pacific coast, pretty much from west to east. Thousands upon thousands of sea otters were taken out of California waters, including um, up to 2,000 sea otters per year, only out of San Francisco Bay Area um, in the early 1800s, as some historical sources attest. So this is the original worldwide range of the southern sea otter, I mean, I'm sorry, of the sea otter um, species. And then um, serial depletion due to hunting reduced it to just a few remnant colonies. And the one I want to draw your attention to is the one uh, all alone by itself um, to the far right. Um, that's a tiny colony that existed off the Big Sur coast of California. So most people thought that the sea otter was extinct in the lower 48. Um, there were a few biologists for the California Department of Fish and Game who knew that they were still around, and there were a few locals who knew. And the state of California protected sea otters from hunting or harassment or any um, form of take in 1913. 1938, um, Highway 1 was completed in the Big Sur area, and Bixby Bridge was built. And um, the next year, Life Magazine published this story, um, The Extinct Sea Otter Swims Back to Life. So um, at that point, the public was informed that sea otters had, in fact, survived in the lower 48. So from 1938 onward, the population gradually expanded down the coast. And when it reached the area north of Morro Bay in the 1960s, it came into contact with what was then a lucrative commercial abalone fishery. There was a lot of controversy that um, began at that point. The fishermen had grown up in a world uh, for several generations that was totally devoid of sea otters. There were piles and piles of abalone around, and they consider that to be the normal and natural condition of things. So when sea otters came in and started to change things, they saw sea otters as the destroyer of the natural bounty. Um, they saw them really as pillaging and destroying the coastal ecosystems. But what they didn't know is that those systems had really looked very different before sea otters were nearly extinguished from that coast. 1968, Margaret Owings formed um, Friends of the Sea Otter to protect sea otters from the calls for removal. So uh, fishermen were saying, hey, just get these otters away from our abalone beds. We don't care what you do with them. Just take them somewhere else. Um, the Friends of the Sea Otter was initially opposed to any sort of removals. They said the sea otter has a right to be here just as anyone else does. But then in 1969, there was a major blowout of Platform A off of Santa Barbara, massive oil spill, and um, one of the main events that triggered the modern environmental movement. Um, probably was responsible for the passage of in, crucial environmental laws in the early 1970s, including the Endangered Species Act and Marine Mammal Protection Act. It also got people thinking about sea otters and their vulnerability. Um, here we had just a population along the central coast that was um, <laughs> isolated, uh, pretty much all in one area, and it could easily be wiped out by a single catastrophic event. So people started thinking about what to do, and as people were thinking about it, the range continued to expand southward. And by 1987, um, a plan had been formulated to do a translocation to establish an additional colony that would serve as a safeguard for the population in case of a catastrophe. But as a concession to commercial fishing interests and also to the oil companies that didn't want um, sea otters interfering um, or causing problems with permitting, there was also a management zone associated with this plan. The management zone was supposed to be kept otter-free by non-lethal means as long as the program was in effect. So in 1982, our recovery plan recommended a sea otter translocation as a primary recovery action for the subspecies. And the idea was to establish a second population of at least 150 sea otters 
had sufficient recruitment that you could then take up to 25 amateur sea otters per year for up to three years and move them back into the Central California range in the event of some catastrophe. So this idea required a lot of moving of sea otters and having them do what you want. It seemed like a simple thing at the time. <laughs> so um, there was some question about whether the Marine Mammal Protection Act would allow um, this scheme to be put in place uh, because there was a lot of moving of sea otters involved. Um, and a special law was passed to authorize the translocation program, public law 99625. That law didn't specify where the translocation program um, would occur or even that it had to occur, but it said that if it does occur, it has to have a translocation zone. That's where you're going to put sea otters. And it has to have a surrounding management or no otter zone, and that's the place you're going to keep otter free um, by non-lethal means, meaning capture and removal, um, as long as this program exists. So this is a map of the translocation and management zones that was in our environmental impact statement. San Nicolas Island was chosen as the translocation zone and the entire Southern California Bight from Point Conception down to the Mexican border was designated a management zone. <coughs> when we put this program in place, we also designated failure criteria. There are very specific regular cri regulatory criteria that would, we would use to determine if the translocation had failed. So, um, at this point, we were taking common language about success or failure of translocations out of common language and we were putting it into regulation. And um, the plan was very uh, explicit in saying, just because you have otters at San Nicolas Island does not make a success. It has to fulfill this recovery strategy of producing the surplus of otters. Um, and it also, in an unspoken way, it had to fulfill this had to live up to this concept that you could just take and move sea otters and put them wherever and, um, and have them stay there. So this is what happened. We moved 140 sea otters to San Nicolas Island, and most of them left immediately. 14 went right back to their capture <laughs> locations along the mainland coast. Uh, 25 returned to the occupied mainland range where there were other sea otters, but not exactly their capture location and 18 scattered into the Southern California Bight where there were currently no other sea otters. So we had initially very um, optimistic hopes for this population. We thought um, the experimental population would be established uh, within about a dozen years and it would reach carrying capacity soon. Um, by, by the definition of the program, the population would be established when it reached 150 sea otters. So um, in 1993, when translocations to the island ended, there were only about 12 sea otters. Um, in 2012, when we terminated the program, there were about 51. And um, in more recent years, the population has started growing rapidly at about 10% per year. Um, and now there are 90, about 93, according to the latest count. Um, but again, that's still well below what the initial <laughs> hope was for an, an established population. So. Um, Implementing this management zone concept was um, even, more, even more of an exercise in futility. So otters scattered from San Nicolas Islands. Um, many of them went to San Miguel Island and had to be removed. Others went to other portions of um, the management zone. And uh, some of them came back after they were removed because they considered Southern California their home now. So um, all of this showed that sea otters have a very strong homing tendency they're wild animals that have grown up in a particular place, they have a home range, um, they really want to go back to it. An additional complicating factor is that um, in the late 1990s, large numbers of sea otters started entering the zone from the mainland range. These were not translocated otters, these were wild sea otters from the remnant population, and they uh, were seasonally moving into and out of the range. These were uh, typically uh, male, mostly male <laughs> rafts of otters that moved out of breeding territories seasonally um, and moved back into breeding territories um, when most of the females were um, in estrus. So the idea of capturing and removing this number of sea otters was not only seemingly impossible feat um, and also futile because the otters were actually coming and going seasonally, had proven themselves very capable and fast swimmers, <coughs> had proven themselves um, determined to be where they want to be. Um, it also 
uh, was clearly harmful to the population. They were socially segregating for a reason, and um, to interfere with that in perpetuity, we saw as a great harm to the southern sea otter. So in 2003, a revised recovery plan switched strategy away from this idea of moving sea otters back and forth um, like chess pieces and said, you know, we just need to rely on natural range expansion. Range expansion is happening. Let's just go with that. And so range expansion did continue to happen, and um, we reevaluated the translocation program under NEPA. We terminated it in 2012. Um, but the irony there is that as soon as we made it politically feasible for sea otters to enter Southern California waters, um, and we're anticipating this um, nice continued range expansion, we, we see that range expansion stops. And in fact, it hasn't happened at all for 10 years. And before that, um, even so, it, it had slowed down or it was doing pulses of expansion and retraction. So why was that? This is um, the USGS map for 2018. This um, summarizes the results of our most recent survey. And what you can see here is a density map um, where the paler yellow is low density and the um, more intense orange or reddish orange are much higher densities. So you'll see up in this area right here, lots of yellow low density. And down here, lots of yellow low density. If you have low densities at the range ends, you're not going to get range expansion. Um, adult female sea otters have small home ranges. They don't go great distances. So if you don't have um, females adjacent to where um, the resources become abundant again and where they want to enter, you're not going to get range expansion. But if these are at low densities, why wouldn't sea otters want to enter? Well, um, we've had increasingly high levels of white shark bite mortality in these areas. It's always been high at the north end of the range, which has always slowed down the northward range expansion. But um, over the last 20 years, and especially the last 10, it's become extremely intense also at the southern end of the range, and uh, we're quite convinced that's what's preventing um, range expansion. In the meantime, we've had an increase in numbers of sea otters in the central portion of the range, from Seaside to Cayucas. And uh, we kind of wondered why, because for years um, we had good evidence that those sea otters were at carrying capacity. But um, for sea otters, it seems that carrying capacity is determined um, mostly or exclusively by prey availability. And um, we had this event associated um, perhaps with the warm blob, the spread of disease in sea stars, which wiped them out from the entire um, coastal, the entire coast of North America pretty much a few years ago. So you have sea otters, I'm sorry, sea stars wasting away, their arms falling off. And um, in response, got a lot of sea urchins. So it turns out sea stars are extremely important predators of the smaller size classes of sea urchins. And then when they graduate to the larger size classes, sea otters take care of them. Um, but without sea stars to control these um, smaller size classes, we had a great abundance of sea urchins available. And that meant that these youngster sea otters that were just graduating, had just been weaned, they're juveniles, they're not very good at foraging yet, um, a lot of them would typically die in an area that's food limited. We think that many more of these um, youngsters survived because they had easy supply of sea urchins um, that helped them make it through that critical period where they're learning how to forage for themselves. So what we have is a situation that um, looks pretty good in, a, in terms of number, but has a lot of complexity um, and perhaps that pulse of sea otter growth in the center of the range is something that is not going to last because um, we hope and assume that sea stars will recover um, from this devastating disease and things will go um, kind of back to the levels that we had seen previously. Before I leave this slide, I just want to direct your attention to this area right here. That's um, Elkhorn Slough, right? off of Moss Landing. I'm going to be talking about that in a second, but I won't be showing you this map again. So that's where it is, high density area of sea otters. So this is um, the population trajectory in relation to the recovery criterion we have under the Endangered Species Act. 
Uh, the idea was that if Sea Otters reached 3,090 or exceeded that for three consecutive years, we would um, consider delisting the subspecies. So in 2018, they reached that level. Um, as, and as you can see, the darker blue line there, that's the population index that includes all sea otters, mainland and San, San Nicolas Island. Um, the paler blue line includes only mainland sea otters. So you can see that um, the San Nicolas Island population, which is the difference between those two, actually bumped us into the realm of uh, delisting consideration. We started including those sea otters in the overall count um, in 2013 after we terminated the program and the experimental status of those sea otters at San Nick in 2012. So um, we're planning to do a status review of the species um, that evaluates all the factors um, that are affecting it and um, that would affect its future prognosis in an effort to answer the question, is the sea otter, is the southern sea otter likely to become endangered within the foreseeable future? And if not, then delisting is appropriate. And if yes, then delisting is not yet appropriate. But um, we have several mandates that apply to sea otters. The other most important one is the Marine Mammal Protection Act. So under the Endangered Species Act, we're trying to prevent the extinction of a subspecies. So that's really sort of like bottom level. I would hope we can all agree. Let's at least prevent extinction. But the Marine Mammal Protection Act actually has more lofty goals, um, I think. The main goal is to restore ecosystems. Um, and the mandate there is to prevent any marine mammal species or stock from declining to the point where it's no longer a significant functioning element of the ecosystem of which it's a part. Now, if you look at the map here, you can see the southern sea otter current range in relation to its historic range. And you can see that um, there are huge, vast areas of the coastline that are not occupied by sea otters. So therefore, they're not performing their keystone functions that we heard about. Um, earlier this morning. So clearly, they're not a significant functioning element of the ecosystems of which they're a part. And so that is really the longer term goal that motivates um, our concept of sea otter management in the future. So you heard about sea otter kelp um, and sea urchin trophic cascades um, earlier this morning. But I also want to talk about another trophic cascade that's been discovered. And this is in Elkhorn Slough near Moss Landing, which is that portion of the map I showed you, um, in which we have extremely high densities of sea otters. In fact, um, this is the only estuary currently occupied by southern sea otters, although there are, um, there's an extremely large estuary, uh, San Francisco Bay, just north of their existing range. And there are other estuaries in California that they have not yet recolonized. Uh, but this one is extremely interesting for a lot of reasons. First of all, um, the Monterey Bay Aquarium has been rehabilitating stranded southern sea otter pups. Um, in the past, those were raised by humans and they became problem animals because they didn't forage properly and they were human identified. It didn't work out. But they developed a surrogate um, sea otter program where they took non-releasable captive female sea otters and introduced them to these releasable pups. And these female sea otters helped to raise these pups, teach them how to be sea otters, and then those sea otters are released. And they've, they've chosen Elkhorn Slough as the place where they're releasing these sea otters. It's a good place because it has um, pretty calm, you know, there are not big waves in there. It's an estuary, more closely resembles a tank. These are sea otters that don't have a home. They don't have a home range. They came from, I mean, they stranded on a beach somewhere when there were tiny pups, and then they were raised in a tank. So they don't presumably have the same homing tendencies as wild sea otters. Also, an estuary is sort of like a containment pen in a sense because it's bounded on most sides and it just has um, an opening at the mouth. So all of those things um, made it a good place to release sea otters. So those rehab sea otters augmented the wild population. And then um, it turned out caused extraordinary changes that were unanticipated by anyone um, in the seagrass community through this more complicated trophic cascade whereby sea otters eat lots and lots of crabs freeing up these mesograzers, um, sea hares like this one you see um, on the left, and isopods, freeing them up to do their good work, which is to travel up and down the seagrass blades, not eating the seagrass, but cleaning off the algal epiphytes that grow on the seagrass um, and threaten to snuff them out by blocking sunlight. 
So in doing so, sea otters are protecting the seagrass um, for all the other organisms that use it as nursery habitat, feeding habitat, um, shelter, um, and also contributing to carbon sequestration and helping uh, to combat climate change and ocean acidification, in addition to the work that they're doing um, with kelp on the outer coast. So I want to conclude just with the idea um, that sea otters are likely to continue to have unanticipated effects. I don't think we know all of the indirect effects that sea otters have or are likely to have. They haven't recolonized um, many habitats, and there are local differences in these habitats. And I would say that just as with wolves um, and the unexpected, far-reaching ecosystem consequences they had in Yellowstone when they were reintroduced, we should keep in mind that there are probably many other indirect effects that we're not yet aware of uh, and that we have the exciting opportunity to discover as sea otters re-enter these environments that were part of their historic habitat. That's it. Thanks. Thank <laughs> you.